utter madness and confusion. Albanese doesn't know his own bill. And jailed whistleblowers prove government fears truth. Coming up on today's Citizens Report. Welcome to the Citizens Report for the 14th of November 2024. I'm Elisa Barwick. Joining me today is Citizens Party Research Director Robert Barwick. Welcome, Robbie. Thanks, Elisa. And on today's show, we're going to be talking about the hearing that occurred on Monday on the Misinformation and Disinformation Bill with some stunning revelations. And then we're going to raise the case of whistleblower Richard Boyle, among other cases, to show how the government really is not concerned about misinformation and disinformation because if it were, it would be happy for the truth to be revealed as various whistleblowers have been revealing Instead in this country. They jail them. They do. So stay tuned for that one. Uh, now, do help us share this show as widely as possible to get these um, truths out and circulating. So you can hit the, uh, the like button, you can comment below, share on social media, uh, and please do, if you can, contribute. There's a donate link to support all of our activities and particularly this weekend we have our national conference, which is a big event. We do, Elisa. Um, now, for viewers of this show, uh, we're going to have a link below where you can watch the live stream on Sunday. It starts at 9am on Sunday and goes till 5pm. It's the Citizens Party's national um, uh, policy platform launch. Uh, for the next election. The conference is called Return Government to the People. I've got a copy of the program here. Um, so uh, the link will, sh will show you who the speakers are, etc. We've got a, a, an excellent um, uh, itinerary of speakers, people like former Ambassador John Lander, Kingsley Liu from the uh, past president of Asian Australian Lawyers Association, Aisha Novakovic, who's a lawyer and a, and a young entrepreneur, You'll be speaking, Dr. Evan Jones will be speaking, former lecturer at Sydney University, Albanese's lecturer, economics lecturer actually, um, Associate Professor Dr. Andy Schmulo, uh, independent economist John Adams, bank victims, advocate Michael Sanderson, the former chair of the, Tasm of the, chair of the Tasmanian Small Business Council and former chair of Cosbauer, Jeff Fader. Um, they're gonna be talking about banking related issues. John Shipton, um, the anti-war activist who's the, who was the greatest advocate for his son, Julian Assange will be there. Um, Dr. Hakim uh, Gessiep, the Secretary of the Islamic Society of Melbourne Eastern Region, and I'll be speaking as well. And we're going to launch our policy platform because the next federal election is around the corner. Um, one of the points that we want people to understand is when you follow the work of the Citizens Party, we've been profoundly effective um, in getting issues addressed. Uh, we, we've stopping bad legislation in Parliament, like we're trying to do now with the MAD Bill, etc. Um, but it's time that a party like us was in Parliament, right? And so we're pulling out all the stops uh, for the election campaign. Uh, it's going to be a packed venue, but you can register to watch it online, so please do. Now, another thing, Lisa, before we move on, um, just a really quick update on what we called in the uh, alert service this week, uh, under the headline, don't wait for a political saviour, the Donald Trump roller coaster ride. <laughs> <laughs> Wee! So, so and what I mean by that is Donald Trump is now rolling out his appointments and it is a roller coaster. Now, we're going to talk about something positive soon in relation to the MAD bill, but the other appointments have been um, not all positive. In fact, some have been ridiculous. And, and what I mean by, we have grounds to criticise Donald Trump because Everybody knows that his number one point about American politics is he's going to end the never-ending wars. Well, he has just point, appointed a series of the most scummy warmongers in America to key posts. To the Secretary of State, Marco Rubio, to Elise Stefanik, who's the UN ambassador, to um, the National Security Advisor, Tim Waltz. Mm. These are people who have spent the last three or four years cheering on what caused the, Iraq, the Ukraine war and leading mm. up to it. Um, they, are, they are mad, absolutely mad. They, they, they have blood coming from their mouth with froth over their joy at what's happening in Gaza, mm -hmm. these people. They are despicable appointees. And yet Donald Trump has this view, 
and he, he because he kept being, getting challenged on the campaign trail about the appointment of John Bolton, who is a war criminal who should have been in jail. And Donald Trump agreed. Mm -hmm. But his attitude was, oh, he, it's like he employs these people like to be the equivalent of a Rottweiler on a leash so that when he, as the great negotiator, offers another country a, a deal, mm. they think, oh, we better take that deal or this guy's capable of starting a war. Well, Trump may have that much hubris that he thinks he can manage all that, but if he, that's playing with fire, right? And it go, flies, he's getting a lot of criticism from his core base because it flies in the face of that. However, like I said, it's a roller coaster because, <laughs> breaking news today, he has just appointed Tulsi Gabbard mm as the Director of National Intelligence. Mm. And so as the Director of National Intelligence, Tulsi Gabbard's job is to take all the intelligence from these very corrupt, evil intelligence agencies who are the biggest liars on the planet and present the intelligence to Trump. Except Tulsi Gabbard made a name for herself by opposing, being one of the first Congress people to come out opposing the regime change wars and copped a lot of criticism. She's genuine on where she stands on most of this stuff. So this is a positive appointment, and it's like, sure, at least you, you know, about time you made a good appointment. Mm. So it is a roller coaster. We'll see how it goes, but I just wanted to make that editorial comment. Yes, yes. Um, so we'll come back to that because we're going to discuss now the misinformation and disinformation bill and Trump's intervention on that in our first topic: utter madness and confusion. Albanese doesn't know his own bill, and that's what's been revealed in the hearing that took place uh, on this legislation in the Parliament on Monday, and we'll get to that in a moment. But uh, as you said, Trump did make a positive intervention in this process, which is uh, has been rolled out worldwide, and it ran into trouble in the United States itself because of. Um, the provisions in the Constitution for freedom of speech uh, and therefore there's been some uh, perception that countries like Australia could get such laws through the back door that could then be rolled out through social media, um, you know, new standards for social media globally. Um, but that's also running into trouble. Now Trump's particular intervention on this was quite uh, direct, specifically discussing this issue of misinformation and disinformation. So he actually recorded a scripted video on the subject, which we will play so that you get the full gamut of that. If we don't have free speech, then we just don't have a free country. It's as simple as that. If this most fundamental right is allowed to perish, then the rest of our rights and liberties will topple just like dominoes, one by one, they'll go down. That's why today I'm announcing my plan to shatter the left-wing censorship regime and to reclaim the right to free speech for all Americans. And reclaim is a very important word in this case because they've taken it away. In recent weeks, bombshell reports have confirmed that a sinister group of deep state bureaucrats, Silicon Valley tyrants, left-wing activists and depraved corporate news media have been conspiring to manipulate and silence the American people. They have collaborated to suppress vital information on everything from elections to public health. The censorship cartel must be dismantled and destroyed, and it must happen immediately. And here is my plan. First, within hours of my inauguration, I will sign an executive order banning any federal department or agency from colluding with any organization, business, or person to censor, limit, categorize, or impede the lawful speech of American citizens. I will then ban federal money from being used to label domestic speech as mis- or disinformation. And I will begin the process of identifying and firing every federal bureaucrat who has engaged in domestic censorship, directly or indirectly, whether they are the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Health, Human Services, the FBI, the DOJ, no matter who they are. Second, I will order the Department of Justice to investigate all parties involved in the new online censorship regime, which is absolutely destructive and terrible, and to aggressively prosecute any and all crimes identified. These include possible violations of federal civil rights law, campaign finance laws, federal election law, 
securities law and antitrust laws, the Hatch Act, and a host of other potential criminal, civil, regulatory, and constitutional offenses. To assist in these efforts, I am urging House Republicans to immediately send preservation letters — and we have to do this right now — to the Biden administration, the Biden campaign, and every Silicon Valley tech giant, ordering them not to destroy evidence of censorship. Third, upon my inauguration as President, I will ask Congress to send a bill to my desk revising Section 230 to get big online platforms out of censorship business. From now on, digital platforms should only qualify for immunity protection under Section 230 if they meet high standards of neutrality, transparency, fairness, and non-discrimination. We should require these platforms to increase their efforts to take down unlawful content such as child exploitation and promoting terrorism while dramatically curtailing their power to arbitrarily restrict lawful speech. Fourth, we need to break up the entire toxic censorship industry that has arisen under the false guise of tackling so-called mis- and disinformation. The Federal Government should immediately stop funding all nonprofits and academic programs that support this authoritarian project. If any U.S. university is discovered to have engaged in censorship activities or election interferences in the past, such as flagging social media content for removal of blacklisting, those universities should lose federal research dollars and federal student loan support for a period of five years and maybe more. We should also enact new laws laying out clear criminal penalties for federal bureaucrats who partner with private entities to do an end run around the Constitution and deprive Americans of their First, Fourth, and Fifth Amendment rights. In other words, deprive them of their vote. And once you lose those elections, and once you lose your borders like we have, you no longer have a country. Furthermore, to confront the problems of major platforms being infiltrated by legions of former deep staters and intelligence officials, there should be a seven-year calling-off period before any employee of the FBI, CIA, NSA, DNI, DHS, or DOD is allowed to take a job at a company possessing vast quantities of U.S. user data. Fifth, the time has finally come for Congress to pass a digital Bill of Rights. This should include a right to digital due process. In other words, government officials should need a court order to take down online content, not send information requests such as the FBI was sending to Twitter. Furthermore, when users of big online platforms have their content or accounts removed, throttled, shadow banned, or otherwise restricted, no matter what name they use, they should have the right to be informed that it's happening, the right to a specific explanation of the reason why, and the right to a timely appeal. In addition, all users over the age of 18 should have the right to opt out of content moderation and curation entirely and receive an unmanipulated stream of information if they so choose. The fight for free speech is a matter of victory or death for America and for the survival of Western civilization itself. When I am President, this whole rotten system of censorship and information control will be ripped out of the system at large. There won't be anything left. By restoring free speech, we'll begin to reclaim our democracy and save our nation. Thank you, and God bless America. So, at least that's an enormous shot across the bow of the Australian government. Um, and the question is, how are they going to respond to that? And here's, I just roll my eyes thinking about it, because here's, here's Albanese, who's such a pathetic, cowardly sycophant. He has gone along with every single thing that the Americans have demanded in terms of war. He's turned us, our country into a U.S. base. But, this, but the slimy bastard is capable of deciding, oh, I'm going to use this issue to show that I'm not in America's pocket. Whereas this is an issue which is about free speech, mm. right? So anyway, that said, the complicating factor for Albanese is the platforms that he wants to regulate, the big social media platforms, most of them 
the only one I can think of which, which is not is TikTok, a US owned. And so he's going to try and regulate political opinion, and we'll, we'll elaborate on that in a second, on um, p platforms that the, pres the president-elect of America has said will be illegal in America where they're based. Mm. So this, this is a very complicating factor for Albanese going forward. Yes. Now, bear in mind that the government revived this bill earlier in the year because, remember, in its first incarnation, it had received 24,000 submissions condemning it and they had to put it on ice. They really had no option. Um, but after um, Communications Minister Michelle Rowland went to Europe and consulted with um, the Brits and the US government, it was back on the agenda. We had the visit from um, the US uh, representative of the... Um, Ministry of Truth, the, the it, Disinformation Governance Board, yeah, Nina, Nina Jankovic. Came down here and it was back on the agenda. Um, and, you know, regardless of what happens in the US, we've made the point, we have to defeat it, defeat it here. Yep. And we can, as we've shown, it was already put on ice once and it's about to be deep six by the look of it, but we need to keep up the pressure until the very, you know, last moment. Now, on Monday, we just want to go through in a little bit of depth what happened in the hearings, um, but I'll just characterise it by the, what the Sydney Morning Herald said on the 11th of November. Albanese's governments, Albanese government's misinformation and disinformation bill on the brink of defeat as key senators withhold their support. And they described the hearing on Monday as bruising. Um, now, National Senator Ross Cadell asked the Communications Department, uh, which insists it consulted widely with stakeholders on the bill. He said, then how is it at this point of the day that not one witness who isn't a government agency says this bill should pass as it is. That was the question of the day, I tell you, because um, this is, yeah, you've got all, all the succession of government departments endorsing the bill, but every single independent witness is like, hang on, this has got huge problems. Oh yeah, we've consulted widely. Ross Cadell, um, spot on. I nailed it. Nailed it. Um, now, experts at the hearing could not say who would be the quote-unquote arbiter of truth when Senator Malcolm Roberts from One Nation posed the question. And two key experts, um, when they were quizzed about the bill itself, had to come back, and this is, this is where it gets rather extraordinary, to the wording of the explanatory, explanatory memorandum because they pointed to the fact that where the wording of the bill seemed rather innocuous, um, in these cases, the clarification legally comes from the explanatory, explanatory memorandum, which elaborates on the intent of the bill. So the, government, the government releases a bill, and if you've ever, ever read a bill, it's kind of boring. They, they, use, they try and use precise, they're supposed to use precise language, etc., and mm. it's kind of hard to read. So, yeah, so they always produce this thing called the explanatory memorandum, which allows you to understand the bill. And yeah, what we're about to go through from these two witnesses in yes. the explanatory memorandum is jaw-dropping, and it just proves the whole case that this is censorship. So this first video is um, constitutional expert Anne Toomey, who was questioned, as you'll see, by Senator Matt Canavan, who, who goes through a couple of really crucial points, one that you can't rely on fact checkers to uh, determine the truth and secondly which is really crucial that the law is intended to censor political opinions. And she used the example of a German election which yeah. the explanatory memorandum criticises because the voters in Germany went for a far right party on the basis of what the explanatory memorandum claims was disinformation. Mm. And but just before we came in here, Elisa, breaking news, um, Senator Canavan actually tweeted about the other example in the explanatory memorandum, which didn't come up in the hearing, but it's in the memorandum, where they also talk about the Italian election mm. and they blame the outcome of the Italian election of the current Italian government. Our government, in this explanatory memorandum, blames the election of the current Italian government our ally, and Matt Canavan points out, we're actually doing naval exercises with this government right now. We, our government is calling their election the result of disinformation that they would censor here in Australia. Mm. It's just, it's like, who? here's Albanese going out there 
saying, oh no, this is not a censorship bill. Mm. He's not even reading his own explanatory memoranda. But let the witnesses... Madness and confusion. Madness let's, and confusion. Let's roll the clip. I just had one question just around the whether or not the bill, in your view, potentially restricts uh, co the constitutional protection for the for political freedom of political discussion. Uh, I know the expansion memoranda has some uh, attempt there to say it doesn't. I, I wonder whether it seriously does meet a test of proportionality. It, it seems to me a bit of a tick and flick uh, around this issue. I think it raises serious issues about uh, political communication. Just wanted your view on on how do you think, I know it's hard to speculate, but how do you think a High Court might view some of the actions taken potentially under this bill? OK, I'm guessing that that's to me. Um, uh, well, all right, first of all, there are bits in the bill where they attempt to put in a, a proportionality test to um, uh, address that. Uh, they pop up in a few places, but curiously, they don't use the same wording that the High Court does. So it's a more minimal test. So, for example, if um, ACMA uh, can't approve a code unless it's satisfied that, you know, it's reasonably necessary, etc. Um, so they don't use the exact words, so that's going to be a problem in itself. Uh, but look, I think that there are um, potentially, and it depends, there seems to be a difference between what's actually said in the bill and then what the EM says it's supposed to say, all right? And this is where I find this all very confusing. So the bill, for example, says that it's misleading if it's reasonably verifiable as false and misleading, OK? And a normal human being would think, OK, then is that something that you can actually prove is a matter that's true or false? So, for example, uh, uh, an advertisement that uses a celebrity space and says that, you know, uh, or Twee Forest or someone and says that, you know, I'm supporting this and here's my business thing. And it's a scam. It's, uh, it's false, OK? Things like that you can just prove that are false. Fine. But then you look at what it says in the EM, and it says, no, we're not just dealing with facts here. We're dealing with opinions and commentary and claims and invective. And you think, well, you can't prove those things are false. You can't prove that someone's opinion is false. It's an opinion. Um, and so then it goes on in the EM, and it says, oh, how do you do that? Oh, you just you get a fact checker to decide. I deal with fact checkers all the time. Um, in fact, during some periods, I felt like I've been working for free for them for a probably long time. Um, and look, and that's a problem in itself. I mean, get, getting experts, OK? There are very few people who are prepared to waste their time doing this stuff because they have a real job, OK? So there are very few people who actually do it. You can be quite selective about the experts that you choose. On any political issue, you can find experts on both sides. So say, for example, coalition argument for the next election, Nuclear energy is economically efficient and better than renewables. All right, assume that's what, what what you're stating. Could you find three economists who'd say no, nuclear energy is not more efficient than renewables? Mm. Pretty easy, I would imagine. Okay, so you can find that and you put it out there. Um, you've now put out a fact check out there saying that that's um, false or misleading on the basis of um, what's said. Well, then you'd say, okay, well, does that cause harm? All right. And then you look at the serious harm, and then it says, well, harm to the operation or integrity of a Commonwealth electoral process. And you'd think, on the face of the words, well, this isn't harming the process at all. But then you look at the explanatory memorandum, and the explanatory memorandum gives these examples of um, Germany, where disinforming news sort of um, nudged, drove people into the arms of a right-wing populist party. And it goes on to say that the study concluded disinformation beliefs were apparently one of the reasons for the electoral success of right-wing populists. And it goes on and says that misinformation of this kind can cause people to um, not be giving genuine votes and that undermines the electoral process. All right, so if that's true, if what's said in the explanatory memorandum is actually right, then this is getting into um, the actual political issues that lead to the voting. So on the, on the face of the words, you'd say, well, no, it's not, because it's only about undermining the electoral process itself. So, you know, people who make silly arguments about um, voting machines being rigged. We don't use a voting machine. We use a pencil. OK, that's verifiably untrue. But once you get beyond what's verifiably untrue to things like claims and opinions that are made during an election process, and once you say, oh, it's not just the electoral process, but we say the electoral process is undermined if people are told things that might mislead them, 
then your rights lap bang into political communication. And that's where the thing will fall over. Now, the problem for me is that when I read the bill, I thought, oh, it's okay, because it's referring to things that are verifiably false and that's only dealing with, if you're mucking up the electoral processes, not the political content. But when I read the explanatory memorandum, I'm seeing something completely different. All right? And that confusion for me um, uh, is, is where potentially the um, constitutional problem comes. Right, so there you have it. That's a clear, very clear point of view from Anne Toomey. Anne Toomey is probably Australia's leading constitutional law expert. Yeah. She is right up there. She, um, and we're going to put a link below, yes. Elisa, to she did a 23-minute full explanation of the bill where she sorted out the lies from the truth. And by lies, I mean there's a, lot of, there's a lot of stuff out there saying, oh, you'll go to jail for what you post on social media. People are probably conflating that with stuff that's happened in the UK. Mm. None, of that. None of that is true. What she explains, though, is the way this can only work is that the social media companies will have no choice to avoid getting massive fines every time they turn around. Mm -hmm. They will have no choice but to put a, a, such a broad um, algorithmic um, protection for mm -hmm. themselves that so many th conversations on so many topics will just be completely suppressed. Black banned. Right? And all this mm -hmm. kind of conversation will not be able to happen. And we saw, what, we saw how it worked in COVID where people were afraid to say the word COVID, they were afraid to say the word vaccines. And because Google, which controls YouTube, went way overboard Put a blanket. In, just, in, in putting blanket bans on that. Mm. We used an example the other week. We, we used the, the S word when it comes to people taking their lives. We put it in a headline of our show. Mm. Our show's views died that week because Google would have Suppresses completely suppressed it. it. Mm. And that's just that's just them following standard practice. For that, that's, that sort of practice has been usual. That's the power of these algorithms. Yes. They will have no choice. So this whole body of debate that's been able to rage on social media because everyone knows the mainstream media lies will be completely suppressed. So mm. she, have a look. It's worth watching that below. Um, but, but let's go to the next bit. Because yes, yes. Um, so the next witness who spoke and was interviewed in this hearing was James McComish from the Victorian Bar Association and he, he described the gaping hole as he put it at the heart of the bill uh, because as he said, for it to be shown that any content is misinformation or disinformation, the true position has to be identified. And you know, as Anne Toomey made clear, identifying the, the true position is not always a straightforward matter because there are differences of opinion. But he then goes to discuss um, the heart of the matter which Anne Toomey raised, which is the censorship of political opinions, which might not be in the body of the bill, but is most certainly in the wording of the explanatory memorandum. And listen to what he says about the precise wording. How it got in there. In that explanatory memorandum. This most peculiar insertion in the explanatory memorandum, which is an extraordinary document, that opinions, claims, commentary and invective can constitute misinformation is one of the most disturbing aspects of this bill for the Victorian Bar, and here's why. When the original expo exposure draft came out, the Victorian Bar made a submission to the Law Council of Australia, which used those words, opinions, claims, commentary and invective, as online content that did not seem to us possibly to amount to information and therefore would not be encompassed within a definition of misinformation in the then exposure draft. And that the task of online platforms and the ACMA would be to distinguish information from things that were opinions, claims, etc., And that there will therefore be a temptation on both platforms and regulators to classify disfavoured opinions as being factual claims about misinformation and therefore within the regulatory net. And you can see that replicated in the Law Council's submission to this Senate inquiry, it's submission number 75 on page 16, replicating the language of the Victorian Bar submission to the Law Council, which in turn made a submission on the exposure draft. What astonished us was then when the explanatory memorandum came out to see that our point, namely that there was a grave danger to freedom of expression, had been flipped on its head 
explicitly in the explanatory memorandum to encompass the very thing that we feared, namely that views, opinions, claims, invective, all of the kind of things that one sees on the internet that are not factual claims which are capable of verification are, according to the government's explanatory memorandum, encompassed in this bill. And as Professor Toomey says, that's getting towards the heartland of the constitutional freedom. Uh, as the Victorian Bar submission makes clear, yes, we have a capital C constitutional concern about the bill, but we also have a much broader concern about freedom of expression, whether expressed in human rights terms or not. And that inclusion of opinion and claims within the definition of misinformation, not according to the text of the bill, mind you, but according to the explanatory memorandum, what gives us grave concern. That's where the language came from. It was our concern about the overreach of the bill has taken on a new life in a very disturbing way in our view. That, that is mind blowing. So these bureaucrats who drafted this bill get a submission from the, the Law Association mm. that uses a submission from the Victorian Bar. And the Bar points out, well, a bill like this can't possibly regulate um, opinions, claims, commentary and invective. It's just things claiming to be facts. Yeah. And so the bureaucrats go, want to bet? That's good. Chuck it in there. <laughs> that's good wording. That's exactly what that we, yeah. encompasses everything. Let's that's put exactly that in. what we want to read, what we want to censor. Oh. This is how legislation is made in Australia. Yeah, who wrote this explanatory memorandum is what we would like to know. Um, you know, th this is who is directing policy in this country. This bill has to be put through the shredder immediately. Absolutely. Now, um, Albanese, interestingly enough, was asked about the opinion that Anne Toomey delivered in that clip that we just short saw on ABC Radio two days ago. Um, and he's, so he's asked, uh, Craig Rucastle in Sydney ABC said to him, um, you know, we've got this misinformation bill, but... Professor Antumi has said it can censor opinions. And he said, no, 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 it's not going to do that. But, but uh, the ABC guy said, yeah, well, but it's in, your, it's in your bill. And Albo's, one of the ways Albo does politics is like he's still stuck at Sydney University doing student politics. Mm -hmm. So it's not about, he never, ever, ever engages in the issue. It's all about no. what kind of smart ass comeback can yeah. he have to try and embarrass the other side. And his response to the name Professor Anne Toomey, the woman you've just seen, the, the giant of constitutional law in Australia, was so dumb, it showed what a moron our Prime Minister is. He said, you get 10 lawyers, you get 10 opinions. Now, the moron thinks he's just undermining her opinion. Oh, that's just her one lawyer's oh, opinion. good comeback. <laughs> yeah, good comeback. Except, Elbow, that's the whole point. If you can admit that you get 10 lawyers, you get 10 opinions, how can you appoint one damn bureaucrat in ACMA to be the arbiter of truth for all of us? One person's opinion or one government department's opinion, you're okay with, but you think that that, become, that gets to define what truth is, yet you acknowledge in your smart, stupid, juvenile, smart-ass comeback that 10 lawyers equals 10 opinions. You're a moron. You're an utter moron. Ditch your own bill <laughs> on I, that basis alone. Seriously, I, I, I do not like getting personal with these politicians, but this guy takes the cake. Mm. Uh, it absolutely takes the cake. Now, let's just look at the status of the bill and tell you what you should do because yes. a number of pundits are already saying the bill is dead in the water. But you know us, we will drive the nails into the coffin before we you know, let it go. Uh, now, and the Sydney Morning Herald did predict that the government won't get the three independent votes they need to pass this, assuming the Greens were to vote for it. Yeah. So if the Greens, and hopefully they won't, but if the Greens do vote for it, let's just say, then they still need three independents to get it through. So let's have a look at the status of the independents. Um, independent Senator Gerard Rennick is a definite no. Good, that's one in our column. Um, two other independents just declared they are not voting for it either. That's Tam Tammy Tyrrell, who put out a tweet we can put up on the screen. Excellent. She's in our column. David Pocock has said he will not vote for it. Another one in that column. Now, there's other three others that are undecided. Jackie Lambie, Fatima Payman, both of those are reported as either leaning against it or being sceptical of it. 
So yep. they're hopeful to go into that column. Lydia Thorpe's office uh, report is reportedly undecided. So hopefully can be tipped into our no column. Uh, David Van is in the yes column, however. Um, yeah, so don't, don't, worry, don't worry about him. He's a waste of space. He's also a, yeah, unpalatable character. Um, the the uh, You've got to appreciate the Labor Party is going to be targeting people like Lambie and Payman and trying to bribe them off with all kinds of offers and, on this, yeah. all right? But... There is very few pieces of legislation that get this much attention as this bill, mm. and so they have to weigh what weigh up the, bar, the the bargain they're being offered against the fact that they need to get re-elected, mm -hmm. right? And if and if they betray the trust of the Australian people mm. on something like this, and so maximum attention. Now, what we have a link to our press release this week, which has, which has the links to all the contact details for the members of the the senators, the independent senators. Call them, call them, and call them. Um, Parliament starts on Monday for, for the last two weeks of mm. the year, right? So there's 20 pieces of legislation that are yeah. a logjam yeah. that the Senate has refused to pass. And they're still coming up with new bills that, to put up there. Yeah, that Albanese and his genius thinks he's going to get passed in the next two weeks. It's just, mm. just ridiculous. But the main thing is to make sure this one doesn't get through. Um, and, and what we really want people to do, and we'll, we'll do another release on this week, next week. People can look out for it. But, but the links below... Click on that link about Professor Ann Toomey's 23-minute speech. Watch it, presentation. Watch it yourself mm -hmm. and see how um, absolutely authoritative her analysis is and email that to all these independents and demand mm. they watch it and demand they respond to you. And right? do send it to the Greens. We do have to keep absolutely. heat on the Greens because their votes will be crucial if some of these independents waver. Um, so we've got to heat, keep the heat on across the board. And you've got to tell these Greens and Senator Thorpe and Senator Payman that, I'll, I'll give you an example, that they should, I can't believe they're even contemplating this because the first issue this year that came up about social media causing trouble was when all the people that are pro-Israel and wanted to justify Israel's genocide in Gaza started attacking TikTok because all these young people were mm. getting, the TikTok wasn't censored and they're getting all these videos that actually show what's happening in Gaza to, to actually see, hang on, this is, there's no justification for this, right? This is just mass slaughter of children, um, you know, by the thousands and thousands and thousands. And this is an issue that Senator Payman, Senator Thorpe, the Greens are supposedly, um, in, you know, supportive of trying to stop what's happening to the Palestinians. And they're falling for this bill. They, they, could, they could be sucking into voting for a bill which is designed to make sure that TikTok could be shut down from doing that kind of thing. So you make sure you tell them that and just say this is unconscionable to even consider supporting this kind of law. All right, and we're going to move to our next topic because this is related very yep. much so on the matters of misinformation, disinformation versus the truth. Jailed whistleblowers prove government fears truth. It's a simple question, Elisa. The government is putting up a misinformation, disinformation law supposedly because they want to stop social media companies sharing things that aren't the truth, yet the same government entirely deliberately, not accidentally, they have they had total power over this because the Attorney General has the power to stop these prosecutions. The same government jails whistleblowers for revealing the truth. Yes. That's their commitment to truth. They are liars. They don't have one. Yes. Now, um, we're specifically going to talk today about Richard Boyle, who, who blew the whistle on the Australian tax office behaviour uh, because on Monday morning he had a court appearance, which we'll tell you about in a moment. But just to set the scene, we want to play this brief but excellent video which talks about uh, what he did. Quick comment from me. You're going to, it's going to reference both Richard Boyle and David McBride. The key point with both of them is what they revealed proved to be true mm -hmm. and forced the government in both cases to act on it. Exactly. They had to clean up the mess. So they didn't reveal something that was unconsequential. It was enormously consequential. They should have been given a medal they should have been for given what a medal. they did, not face jail exactly. or be put in jail. Play the tape. When whistleblower David McBride was thrown in prison, it sent shockwaves around the world. Former military lawyer David, David McBride, McBride has been sentenced to five years and eight months jail. But did you know there's another whistleblower facing trial in Australia? 
and he too could end up in jail. Richard Boyle worked at the Australian tax office. In 2017, he raised concerns after witnessing unethical practices used by the tax office against vulnerable people. Practices like seizing money out of the accounts of small business owners without their knowledge, leaving them with crippling debt. We may be shutting down the wrong businesses and causing great distress to the community and possibly even pushing people towards suicide. Boyle's concerns were dismissed by his superiors and he was pressured to stay silent. At this point, Boyle went to the ABC. A joint Four Corners Fairfax investigation has found that the tax office can appear to act as a law unto itself and sometimes it gets its findings disturbingly wrong. We are making incorrect decisions. It's highly unethical for me to be taking money out of their bank account if their debt is incorrect. His revelations were explosive. They led to a government investigation and reform. Reform that continues to protect vulnerable people against excessive tax office overreach. But instead of being rewarded for speaking out, Boyle's home was raided by police and he now faces trial and likely years in jail. Is my husband going to be dead when I arrive home because of the stress? All of this because the laws meant to protect whistleblowers in Australia are broken. Many believed that when Labor took government, their promises to protect whistleblowers would see an end to the punishment of people like Richard Boyle and David McBride. But those promises have been broken. Not only has the Labor government refused to use their power to drop the prosecutions against Boyle and McBride, but they have failed to fix the broken laws that were meant to protect whistleblowers in the first place. Laws that they've acknowledged are broken. Instead of thanking the people who uncover corruption and wrongdoing in Australia, the Albanese government is now complicit in silencing them. We know what needs to change. Human rights organisations, journalists, lawyers and a growing movement of people are calling for the government to act. They need to fix the broken laws, free David McBride and drop the prosecution against Richard Boyle. Will you join the fight to protect Australia's whistleblowers? All right, so David McBride is in jail and Boyle has to, well, he, on Monday morning, he uh, faced the court in Adelaide and he was told that his criminal trial will commence in November 2025. So he now has to keep his, already eight years, I think this has been hanging over him, and he now faces another year's wait with this hanging over his head. Now, the, re the reason, so they don't, they don't get charged for being whistleblowers. They don't get charged with whistleblowing. There's not a crime of whistleblowing. The reason that this, these things go to court is because there is no act of whistleblowing that does not involve breaking the existing law. In David McBride's case, one of his charges was because, <laughs> because he, to get his documents out of the Defence Department, there's two different colours of paper. One's unclassified, one's classified. He copied the classified documents onto the, un, the, the, the colour of the paper. I forget what it was, pink or blue or whatever, that was unclassified and was able to walk them out and the security didn't even look, mm, right? Because of the colour. And he got charged with stealing stationery. Yeah. But much more serious stuff than that, but including mm. stealing stationery. Um, there's always these, there's, in David, uh, Richard Boyle's case, there's privacy restrictions because he works in the ATO, etc., but he had to breach those privacy restrictions to get to show the cases. So he breached the privacy of the people on who, for whom he was advocating mm. to say to, to show the ATO was victimising these people. They don't care that their privacy was breached, but it was it was technically in breach of the law, mm -hmm. and that's why they can charge these guys and throw the book at them. Yeah, and that's why the attorney general has to intervene in cases such as this exactly. because if it goes to trial, the judge has to. The judge, they broke throw the law. In the cling. They broke the law. He has to find them guilty. He has to follow and there's the consequences, law. Consequences. Right? Exactly. The attorney general can say, "Well, on balance, this led to this outcome. This was in the public interest." We will not prosecute. Mm, exactly. Now, we'll put up some background um, images and perhaps video because there was a good showing out the front of the court on Monday morning for Richard Boyle in support. I mean, just as we've seen um, from uh, the case of Julian Assange uh, to many others, there's just too many of them. Um, 
this is getting the Australian population riled up to defend the truth just as they're reacting against the mad bill. Um, and there were a number of MPs there in support, which is very good to see. Andrew Wilkie, um, Green Senators David Shoebridge and Senator Barbara Pocock and former Senator Rex Patrick. And I just want to play this video of Senator Barbara Pocock addressing the crowd that were there in support of Richard Boyle because um, she points out some important things about his case, but she also talks about um, what she's been involved in in, in uh, parliament, parliamentary inquiries, Senate inquiries, where she's played a very important role against, for instance, PwC. But she goes on to talk about the big consultants um, in more general terms as being bigger than even the big biggest banks mm. in the world. Wow exercising great power, which is the very reason, as she said, that we need whistleblowers. Um, so listen to what she had to say. We stand here today in solidarity with Richard Boyle, solidarity with his family, and to send a strong message to the Albanese government. Set these charges aside. They are unjust. They are wrong. You should do it now. We send Richard and his family support, strength and thanks. Whistleblowers perform a powerful act every time they step forward in our society. Parliament has taught me a lot in my short three years there in the Senate. I think of it now as a three-tiered system. Above the Parliament are very powerful interests, institutions and big corporations who pull the strings and exert, exert way too much power in our Senate and in our House of Representatives. <laughs> too often they run the show and too often those corporations and interests run the show behind the curtain. Below the Parliament are the people, people who exercise our vote every three or four years and alongside the people are whistleblowers. I didn't go to the parliament with a lot of knowledge about whistleblowers, but I'm here to tell you one of the primary lessons I have learned is the importance of whistleblowers to our democracy. We owe Richard and all of the other whistleblowers, David McBride, a great deal of thanks and an enormous debt for the work they do for democracy. <laughs> whistleblowers are an antidote to power. They bring information forward, often very nervously, very frightened, as they should be. They are always arraigned against powerful interests. They are the David to the Goliath of those multiple huge corporate and institutional interests. And the ATO is amongst those institutions. The ATO has made a number of missteps in recent years and I've had the privilege and the challenge of calling out their behaviour through inquiries into big consultants, the big four, and more recently into some of the tax settlements which advantage and protect big corporations. They don't protect you. You get a bill saying you've underpaid your tax, what do you do? You nervously settle it as soon as you can. There are very big corporations reaching deep into their lawyers and sending them off to the courts and off to the ATO to defend their interests and we need whistleblowers who tell us about it. We need whistleblowers who tell us about what's going on inside the big four. I'll just tell you one story. When we ran the, uh, and have run the inquiries into the big four, who are, they're, they're bigger than the banks. They're the really big warriors for neoliberalism in our society. And they exercise great power beyond that of very wealthy banks and, and other corporations. They're the architects of the changes in our system that we've seen in the last 30 years. And I'll tell you just one thing, I had, we had many whistleblowers, good people inside these institutions who rang us, sent us emails, wrote letters and said, here's what's really going on inside. They gave you evidence last Thursday, let me tell you what actually happened. What actually happened inside our firm last Thursday. Let me tell you what happens to whistleblowers. These were people, one person for example, who rang me regularly every Sunday night, set up an appointment, I never knew their name, 
I never knew what organisation they worked for. I didn't know what state they were in. They were so terrified. But they were extremely high up in a very big organisation, one of the big four. They had their PA set up their appointments for them. They had strings to pull of their own. And they rang me and told me information about what was going on in that firm with great nervousness, despite their power, for their job, for their reputation, and for their future employment. So I have nothing but admiration for the individuals who are small players. They've got a family. They've got a bit of super if they're lucky. They hang on to their job if they can. Too many lose everything. Eight years Richard Boyle has given to this struggle. And what did he try and do? He tried to alert people to a practice within the ATO that he judged was unfair and wrong. We needed more whistleblowers doing that around robo-debt. 400,000 Australians who are victims of robo-debt. Three people who took their own lives and possibly more. Hey. It is a great shame. Our country is better than that. And we should not be depending on those small number of whistleblowers and their families and the journalists who take up their stories, also very brave. We need to see change. So what do we need to see? We need to see the Attorney General step forward and the Albanese Labor government take action to drop the charges against Richard Boyle. She's spot on, Elisa. Like, this is the, well, this is one of our themes as a party. Um, I'm gonna rant about this a bit on the weekend. The, the, there's so much corruption between the, the way government interfaces with these with private companies and the biggest private companies all have the same auditors, these big four accounting firms, all around the world, the same auditors. And who audits those auditor, auditors? Nobody. Their partnerships, they've been, they've, they've been allowed to rig the whole system in their favour. And then when you want to find out what actually goes on in the interface between the two, everything is hidden behind commercial inconfidence. Our view as a party is that any private enterprise that mm. does a deal with the government should have no right to commercial inconfidence. It's yes. public money and everything should be completely transparent. But it's all locked away behind commercial inconfidence and therefore the only way you will find this stuff out is if people with a conscience inside mm. are prepared to be whistleblowers and blow the and, and, and come good on it. Yeah. Right? Um, that this we'd have to have whistleblowers and we must protect them at all costs so that we can always keep government mm. and its relationship with big business transparent. And I'll just say that the main themes of our conference and of our policy platform, in fact, are foreign policy independence and economic and financial independence. Yep. Because basically, unless you achieve those two things, you can throw any issue at us Australia ain't going to do the right thing no. if we don't have sovereignty. And a classic, another example of that, um, not exactly a whistleblower, but someone who refused to cooperate with the Anglo-American agenda to target China is Daniel Duggan. And he's been in jail for 754 days. And his team just released a statement that pointed out that, you know, under US orders essentially, which is why he's been kept in jail for extradition, even though he's broken no Australian law, so he shouldn't even be... Um, subject for um, consideration for extradition, but we've got to follow the US orders because we're not sovereign. Um, they stated that under uh, that the Australian government has broken at least 21 of the United Nations standards for the treatment of prisoners, known as the Nelson Mandela rules, violating his and his family's human rights. Absolutely atrocious. And this is why I yell sometimes. Like it's when you, you know when you bother to wrap your mind around the injustices that are perpetrated arbitrarily. Some things happen accidentally, but there's so much stuff that happens mm. arbit because of the arbitrary exercise of power and it shows the at the core we have some real corruption in our government. And I want to finish on this point, Elisa, and it goes to uh, Richard Boyle and, and, and um, uh, David McBride as well, and it goes to the misinformation, disinformation laws. The reason that you have things like weak whistleblower protections, the reason that both parties do something like this with Daniel Duggan and they can both be manipulated to do it, the reason both parties came up with a weak knack is because we, we swing 
between we have a two-party system where we just swing between the both mm -hmm. parties and so we have nine years of the liberals and coalition then we get sick of them and who do we go back to the people who were in there before that mm. and nine years is not enough to bury their skeletons because they've all got skeletons in the closet they've they're all complicit in fundamental wrongdoing against the australian people and they don't want any of that to come out exactly right they are afraid of the truth so of they that coming out cover each other's backsides unless we have now the the positive the, the most positive thing in the australian political landscape is the growth of the cross benches mm. and i mean all of them right I've, I've i've met most of them i mean all of them i don't there's there's plenty we disagree on but what i but my, my view personally from my own experience is that the cross bench members of parliament and senators are not bought off by vested interests and so they're all capable in their own way at times of independent thought that the two major parties are seldom capable of, especially the Labor Party, to be honest. Um, unless, we, unless the Australian people keep voting away from the two major parties and bringing clean skins mm. into Parliament to fundamentally take over the joint, we will never clean this stuff mm. up. That message we have to get through to our fellow citizens because they, they'll, they'll hear about this and they'll feel concerned and upset that they hear about these kind of stories and they go, yeah, how can this happen in Australia? Mm. And then because it's hard to handle, they go and bury their head in the sand again, right? You have to show them that the way we can stop this happening is gets, let's get clean skins mm. in the parliament and really clean this mess up. It's way past time. Yeah, no, we've, and we've seen in Europe, which is why I think they're raising these examples of Germany and Italy in these yeah. bills, that smaller parties can be yeah. in government as part of coalitions and in some cases you have multi-party coalitions so in you some know cases take over the whole show exactly so groups like us are becoming increasingly important and that's why we have to fight these issues you can't allow them to suppress the alternative voices in the way they're trying to do so yep. after you uh press you know get out of this youtube video press pause <laughs> make sure you do uh go and contact these independent and green senators on this issue. Send them Senator, um, send them Ann Toomey's Video. presentation. Yes, be linked below. So that's the show for this week. Thanks, Robbie. Thanks, Lisa. Tune into the Citizens Party's policy yes. launch on Sunday. See you on Sunday. And then we'll see you next week. Thanks. Authorised by Robert Bowick, Citizens Party Melbourne.